on the news. The Diocese of Brooklyn now helping newly arrived migrants when it comes to schooling. Migrants from Central and South America are landing here with nothing but the clothes on their back. I'm Jessica Easthope with how the Diocese of Brooklyn is helping them put down roots and build a new life, starting with getting an education. And a looming rail worker strike could have big consequences for U.S. consumers who are already dealing with high inflation. Also, Pope Francis in Kazakhstan sitting down for a key meeting with a delegation sent by the Russian Orthodox Patriarch. Plus, they didn't have to reel it in. It just jumped aboard. Amazing video of what happened on a fishing boat. I'm Christine Persichetti. Current News starts right now. Idaima Ramirez and her son Marcel are walking the halls of a Catholic school in Brooklyn. A very different experience nine months after walking away from their home country. The family is part of the latest influx of migrants, thousands of whom are being bused to New York via Texas. The Diocese of Brooklyn is welcoming them and promising their children a quality education. Current News' Jessica Easthope has the story from Salve Regina Catholic Academy in East New York. Iraima Ramirez is picking out a uniform for her son Marcel. He's new to Salve Regina Catholic Academy and to this country. Unlike his classmates in seventh grade, he doesn't speak any English and lives in a shelter. He hasn't had a permanent home in nine months. The situation in my country has made it impossible to provide food and necessities for my family or take care of their health on a salary that added up to $15 a month. Idaima's family is one of thousands from Central and South America who have landed in New York City with just the clothes on their backs. The dictatorship in Venezuela has gotten to a point of lawlessness, and so we had to abandon everything we have and risk our lives to find something better. When they arrived in Brooklyn, the family's unbreakable Catholic faith led them to church, where they met Father Ed Mason. These folks have been literally dumped in our city and to be able to serve them and help them at this time is really a blessing. In the last month, Father Mason has raised more than $25,000 to help Yudaima's family and 24 others, some of whom came on buses from Texas. That includes making sure Marcel's Catholic education is free of charge. Showing them the generosity of spirit that we are called to have as Catholics. We definitely want to be able to provide that for them. In the Diocese of Immigrants, Superintendent Deacon Kevin McCormick says this is what the mission of Catholic education looks like. If someone is going to be a follower of Jesus, they have to protect the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner. Whoever comes to our schools, we will work and find a way to educate them. And Iraima says she finally feels like someone has her back. They have opened their hearts and blessed us. They're able to get an education and also have their faith fed. Father Mason is helping three more children enroll at Salve Regina Catholic Academy, where they'll participate in the school's new ESL program and attend tuition free. In East New York, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. And if you're also interested in a Catholic education from the Diocese of Brooklyn, there's still time to enroll. Just visit catholicschoolsbq.org or call 718-965-7380 for more information. On day two of his pilgrimage to Kazakhstan, Pope Francis had a crucial meeting with a delegation sent by the Russian Orthodox Patriarch. And the Holy Father also had a message of peace for the faithful in the country. Although Pope Francis's trip to Kazakhstan is not strictly pastoral in nature, he did make time to celebrate mass with the country's Catholic minority. On the feast of the exaltation of the cross, the Holy Father asked the faithful to remember past suffering and to learn from it to avoid repeating mistakes. Ci fa bene custodire il ricordo di quanto sofferto. Non bisogna ritagliare dalla memoria certe oscurità. Altrimenti se può credere che siano acqua passata e che il cammino del bene sia delineato per sempre. No, la pace non è mai guadagnata una volta per tutti, va conquistata ogni giorno. He urged Kazakhstan's Catholic community to peacefully coexist with their non-Catholic neighbors. 
Living peacefully with your neighbors was the theme of the Pope's speech earlier in the day at the Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions. He began by criticizing religious fanaticism and before representatives of the Russian Patriarch of Moscow said that God is a God of peace, not of war. Non giustifichiamo mai la violenza. Non permettiamo che il sacro venga strumentalizzato da ciò che è profano. Il sacro non sia puntello del potere e il potere non si puntelli di sacralità. After the conference, Pope Francis met with the delegation sent by Russian Orthodox Patriarch Kirill, the close ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin and supporter of the war, was due to meet with the Pope here, but a few weeks ago said he would not be attending. The Pope expressed his desire to the delegation to meet with Patriarch Kirill again. The last confirmed communication between the two was a video call held in March in which the Pope asked the head of Russia's largest church to work for peace in Ukraine. Since the Holy Father celebrated Mass with his flock in Kazakhstan today, let's take a look at the history of Catholicism in the country. The church can actually be first traced back to the 13th century when the King of France, Louis IX, sent missionaries to this territory. 25 years later, Pope Nicholas III entrusted the entire mission to the Franciscan Order, who spent the first half of the 14th century building a small convent and cathedral there. In 1340, persecutions against Christians began and there was no record of their presence for centuries. Then, in the early 20th century, Catholic refugees, soldiers, and prisoners of war arrived during the First World War. But the true turning point for the church in Kazakhstan was in 1992, after the Soviet Union dissolved. This allowed the Holy See and the former Soviet Republic to sign a deal, allowing the church freedom to worship. Be sure to follow Currents News and the tablet for continuing coverage of the Pope's trip to Kazakhstan. Solemn moments for the royal family and the rest of the United Kingdom as Queen Elizabeth II begins lying in state. The long lines of mourners paid their respects before the Queen's coffin, which is now in Westminster Hall. It will remain there until her funeral on Monday. Isabel Rosales has the latest on the tributes and how people are remembering the longest reigning monarch. Draped in a wreath of flowers, Queen Elizabeth II's coffin made its final journey to Westminster Hall Wednesday, where the late Queen will lie in state until her funeral on Monday. The funeral procession led by King Charles III and surrounded by military personnel. Behind the King, his siblings, Princess Anne, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, and the King's two sons, Prince William and Prince Harry. A somber moment for this family and the entire United Kingdom. Crowds stretch for miles around London, some people sleeping on the streets overnight just to ensure they could say a final farewell to a queen who served her people for more than 70 years. It's the one thing I really want to do to come and pay my last respects. Among those paying their respects, dozens of world leaders. This has obviously been a, a shock to everybody. This is you know, going to be a memory that will stand with them and, and with us watching it for, forever. Um, 70 years of service is, is exceptional to any person's life. A moment of grief for the UK rippling across the globe. A sense of uh, gratitude for the contribution that she had made in providing all that steadiness and sense of stillness in the middle of a very troubled and speedy world. Isabel Rosales, Currents News. Helping to say goodbye to Queen Elizabeth II was the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. The Archbishop led a small service at Westminster Hall Wednesday morning. He worked closely with Queen Elizabeth, who also served as Defender of the Faith. Archbishop Welby spoke about what it was like to say goodbye. It's a huge privilege. It's a great honor to do it. And it's also a very solemn moment because I had the privilege of meeting the Queen on many occasions. And there's a deep sense of loss. When asked what people might not know about her, the Archbishop says he particularly remembers the Queen's quick sense of humor and phenomenal memory. 
Queen Elizabeth's faith became a hallmark of her reign, calling it an inspiration and an anchor of her life. In this week's paper, the tablet delves deeper into how the Queen relied on her faith during her charge as ruler of the United Kingdom and the ways she kept her faith even as her country became more and more secularized. The paper is also honoring National Hispanic Heritage Month, which officially begins tomorrow. The staff is taking a look at patron saints endeared by the Hispanic community who have ties to the Diocese of Brooklyn. Those include St. Dominic, whose name was given to both the Dominican Republic and its capital city, Santo Domingo. Our Lady of Guadalupe, a Marian apparition who is venerated as the patroness of Mexico and all the Americas. And St. Martin de Porres, a Dominican brother from Lima, Peru, who helped the needy and ministered to African slaves. To read all these stories and more, just pick up the paper at your local church. You can get future editions sent straight to your mailbox by subscribing at the tablet.org. New York City is getting ready for a final farewell to Port Authority police officer and former Major League Baseball pitcher Anthony Vavaro. The 37-year-old was killed Sunday in a wrong way crash on the New Jersey Turnpike. He was on his way to work at the ceremony for the 9-11 attacks in Lower Manhattan. Vavaro's funeral mass will be Thursday, September 15th at 10.30 a.m. at Our Lady of Good Counsel Church on Staten Island. Be sure to tune in to Currents News for coverage of the event. Event. Meantime, the FDNY is honoring more 9-11 heroes. New York's bravest gathered at their headquarters in Brooklyn for a ceremony to add 37 names to their World Trade Center memorial. The new additions are all heroes who took part in the rescue and recovery efforts at the World Trade Center. The FDNY says almost 300 members have died from 9-11 related illnesses. New York City Mayor Eric Adams is getting ready to combat the migrant crisis by putting them to work. Currently, migrants who come to the U.S. have to go through a six-month process to just apply to work here. In an interview on Tuesday, Mayor Adams asked who is going to pick up the tab for those migrants who have to idly wait. The mayor did not clarify if the migrants would get city or private sector jobs. Mayor Adams' plan comes as the city of El Paso has approved spending up to $2 million over the next 16 months to bust the migrants out of town. The city council voted on Monday to ratify a new services contract with GoGo -Go Charters LLC, which has already been used for busing under the city's emergency ordinance. El Paso is getting quarterly reimbursements from the federal government for the migrant expenses. Also in El Paso, hundreds of migrants are now on the streets. They were released by Border Patrol because processing centers and shelters are full. But now they're having trouble finding showers and bathrooms to use. Migrants have encountered good Samaritans in the city that drop off food, clothes and many essential items. But with no shelter, they're also exposed to the weather. Last night was horrible. Our cardboards would fly away. We woke up all wet. Clothes were wet. The kids got wet, our food got wet, everything got wet. And others are cleaning up because authorities had told us to start cleaning up because we were blocking the streets. El Paso police say migrants could be cited or arrested if they're caught urinating in public, blocking sidewalks or littering. There's a lot more news headed your way. We've been dealing with high inflation, but now a national railroad strike is looming and it could make things worse for consumers. And the fight for life here in the U.S. reaching another level as a new nationwide abortion ban is introduced. Plus, why you may want to talk to your doctor if you're older and don't take a multivitamin. There are now some big changes to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org. could be fair increases for New York City taxis if a new proposal gets approved. Under the plan, meter rates could jump almost 23 percent. This would be the first yellow cab meter rate hike in more than a decade. After September of 2012, Uber jumped into the New York City market and brought big changes to the for hire car industry. The Taxi and Limousine Commission will hold a hearing on the taxi fare hikes on October 6th. Wall Street was rattled by a new report showing U.S. inflation is still in flux. And now a looming rail strike could dramatically affect the shipping of consumer goods, food and gasoline. As Chris Wynn reports, the White House is stepping in to keep the strike from happening. 
A looming nationwide freight rail strike is getting closer to reality as negotiations continue in Washington. You look at the fundamental infrastructure of the country, that affects everyone and people tend to take it for granted. Two rail unions representing about 60,000 engineers and conductors who make up the two-person crews on each train say scheduling rules that keep them on call virtually every day they're not at work, as well as a staffing shortage, are making their work lives intolerable. But the Association of American Railroads Trade Group says the union scheduling demands should be dealt with locally and not through national bargaining. We have supply chain problems already. The ports are clogged. You throw in a rail uh, a strike and tens of thousands of containers can't get to where they want to go. That affects stores in our everyday lives. About 30% of the nation's freight moves by rail, so a strike could be a crippling blow to the U.S. economy. Without freight railroads, oil refineries would have trouble producing their current volumes of gasoline, which could send prices higher. A strike could also disrupt the nation's food supply, preventing recently harvested crops from moving to food processors and disrupting the supply of fertilizer needed for upcoming plantings. And there could be negative impacts on the import of goods for the holiday shopping season, causing shortages and higher prices. We have made crystal clear uh, to the interested parties the harm that American families, businesses and farmers and communities would experience if they were not to reach uh, a resolution. A strike could begin as early as Friday. In Washington, Chris Wynn, Currents News. Northeastern University shut down late Tuesday after an explosive emergency. The incident happened at the college's virtual reality lab. An employee opened a hard plastic case that depressurized with the force of an explosion. The 45-year-old suffered minor hand injuries. According to officials, the package was not sent to the lab through the Postal Service. It contained a note that criticized Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg and the relationship between colleges and developers of virtual reality. The Boston police, the FBI, and the ATF are all working on this active investigation. Schools across Texas continue to boost security in the wake of the Uvalde school shooting. The Texas School Safety Center is conducting intruder audits. What they're doing is making sure every door to every school is locked and working properly. The gunman at Robb Elementary walked through into the school through an unlocked door. Now trained inspectors will be going around the state to schools to see if they can get inside. What we're trying to do is prepare schools to um, minimize um, as much loss to life as possible, um, and in the best case scenario, prevent it completely. Districts and local law enforcement will be notified the month of the inspections, but the day and campus will be unannounced. The idea is for schools to be ready every single day. Things are heating up in the fight for life in our post-Roe America. South Carolina Republican Senator Lindsey Graham has proposed a nationwide ban on abortion after 15 weeks. But as Amy Kiley reports, the measure is being used more as a rallying cry for voters than a push to protect the unborn. They're going to ban abortion if they get in charge. Democrats are pouncing on a new bill from Senator Lindsey Graham. After 15 weeks, no abortion on demand except in cases of rape, incest, to save the life of the mother. Many Democrats were already campaigning on the unpopularity of overturning Roe v. Wade in June. Leader McConnell acknowledged that a federal ban on abortion was now, quote, possible. Possible, but not likely. Senate Republicans were slow to support the bill. I think most of the members of my conference prefer that this be dealt with at the state level. And states are dealing with the issue. West Virginia passed a near total ban yesterday. California has a new website to help people in restrictive states travel there for the procedures. Republicans who control Graham's own state of South Carolina found a near total ban blocked by members of their own party last week. Another barrier to a federal ban is likely a veto. Still, some analysts see Graham's bill as a campaign talking point for the GOP. They say it could appeal to moderates seeking a middle ground while also rallying the base. There is a consensus view by the most prominent pro-life groups in America that this is where America should be at the federal level. I'm Amy Kiley reporting. The president of Ukraine visited a newly liberated territory in Kharkiv. Volodymyr Zelensky spoke to his troops in the city of Izium on Wednesday. Russia forces left the war-ravaged city last week as the Ukrainian military mounted a stunning counteroffensive. Zelensky also toured the devastation in Izium. 
The Archbishop of Santa Fe, New Mexico, is inviting UN representatives once again to begin a dialogue on nuclear disarmament. Archbishop John Wester laid out an invitation at the annual United Nations Prayer Service. Addressing UN delegates, the Archbishop reiterated his invitation he first made in a pastoral letter from January. In that letter, Wester outlined the necessary steps to dismantle the world's nuclear arsenal in order to uphold the biblical ideal of right relationships. The U.S. is setting up a fund that could transfer $3.5 billion to Afghanistan. The White House announced on Wednesday that the U.S. and Switzerland are in the process of creating the fund from $7 billion in frozen Afghan money. Earlier this year, President Biden signed an executive order to allow assets to be distributed inside the country. The new fund could eventually put billions of dollars into Afghanistan to support economic stability in the country. Still to come on Currents News, do you take your vitamins? If not, you might want to start the results of a new study on multivitamins and your brain. Plus, a fisherman gets the surprise of a lifetime, and it was all caught on camera. A new study shows taking a daily multivitamin might help with brain function. Over the course of three years, scientists talked to thousands of people 65 and older and found those who took a multivitamin slowed down cognitive aging by 60 percent. There were even more benefits for people who had a history of heart disease. Scientists say it may be because multivitamins help boost low vitamin C or magnesium levels in older people. But of course, you should talk to your doctor before starting to take vitamins. Vitamins. And while taking out the trash may not be good for your nose, it could soon be a thing of beauty. New York City's Department of Sanitation is calling all artists to transform their trucks into what they're calling trucks of art. The initiative is a zero waste challenge. The artists will be using no longer wanted household paints, which helps to keep them from the landfill. Each truck has nearly 400 feet of canvas, so get your paint brushes ready. You have until this Sunday, September 18th to apply. And finally tonight, it's a fishtail you have to see to believe. A mako shark actually jumped onto a fishing boat off the coast of Maine to the surprise of everyone on board. And as Marissa Bodner reports, the whole thing was caught on camera. David Sinclair runs Sea Ventures Charters out of St. George, taking clients out to fish for sharks that they then get to see up close and help tag. His 16-year-old grandson, Cameron, is his first mate. I believe I caught my first shark when I was four years old. They mostly encounter blue sharks, but on this August day, 15 to 20 miles out to sea, it was a seven-foot mako. And all of a sudden, something took the bait really big, really fast, and we, he jumped. We knew he was a mako instantly. It's on a fishing line with a young man, 16-year-old guy, turning the rod and, you know, having, having fun fighting it. And it jumped uh, four times before it got to the boat. And the next thing we knew, he fell out of the sky and landed in the boat. So. <laughs> the moment captured by the angler's dad who was up on the bridge with his camera. And all of a sudden, here he is, right here in my face. And he hits me with his tail right on my left cheek. And he lands probably three feet from my right foot. Sinclair says Makos are fast fish with big teeth. Everybody scrambled and, you know, I just held my breath. I thought, boy, injuries, uh, high possibility and not a scratch on anybody. The shark was not injured. With everyone all right, he says they took some measurements, tagged the shark, then released it through the transom door. Just awe inspiring to see the power of a fish like that and, and to be able to handle it safely and kick him out. A rather routine ending to an unforgettable fishing trip. Seeing one right here in my face falling out of the sky was pretty impressive. And scary, that was Marissa Bodner reporting. Mako sharks can travel at speeds of up to 20 miles per hour and they can swim up to 30 miles a day. Wow. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.